Hello and welcome back to the Spotlight Games podcast. Today, we are bowing our heads and talking about the death of E3, what that might mean for this summer in gaming, and we're going to look back at our favorite E3 memories, and maybe there might be a little news to sprinkle in there. Only way to find out is to keep listening or to keep watching. As always, I am joined by my sweet dumpster boy. Yeah, yeah, that, brother. The, the clean, a face mm. as clean as a baby's bottom. I don't know, man. You know, oh, so yeah. what in a, and, and this, I think, is a good conversation to ask you if this is something you also experienced because you have much more facial hair than I did. Also, much thicker facial hair than I did. Also, yeah. much thicker other things than I did. <laughs> we're not talking about bellies, folks. Oh, we're not talking um, about dicks either. So, like, one of the things, uh, like, the issue I've been having was I'd be like drinking something, right? Yes. And then, like, my mustache, as crazy as it sounds, we get waterlogged and I would do like this and it would like drain and I didn't know how to stop it. I finally was just so annoyed with it. Also the hair started to turn curl up and get into my nose Yeah, and it was like constantly tickling and then I get like water in it and it would be like wet all the time. And it was, this is just gross, man. Honestly, it was just fucking disgusting. Yeah, oh, for sure. I had to so get I've, rid of it. I never had the curling up into my, or I've never had the curling up into my nose mm. problem, but yeah. if you don't trim it enough, and it starts curling over your lip. Yeah, that's, that's when I that's when I noticed that I would uh, get a little, as you put it, waterlogged. Yeah, uh, I'd get some water in there. And yeah, there are times, especially like I'm brushing my teeth, mm. and I finish brushing my teeth, and I'm, I'm just like drenched. Yeah. yeah, I think that, but like the issue I was like running into is it it would never grow thicker. It just kept growing longer, and I kept <laughs> having to always trim it, but it never looked any better. <laughs> yeah and it was just like i'm walking around with this disgusting mustache and you know so here's the thing though went into the liquor store yeah patrick oh oh sure i got id'd for the first <gasps> time in like no way a couple of years yeah i would like go in maybe like like no one's brazen enough i think in today's time so it's just like walk into like an old people like a nice liquor store and like try to get away with it you know right like you just you walk in like people are just like yeah like and also that you got that gross mustache and they're like this motherfucker is definitely not underage so, <laughs> so like first of all i walked in the guy's like oh, hey bud uh gonna need to see that id first that's so like i mean yeah absolutely dude like no worries at all but also like that's fucking weird man so yeah i definitely like when i walked out of the bathroom i like, looked myself in the mirror and i was like you look like a fucking baby yeah, Goo Goo Gaga, indeed. We're back. We're, We're back. back. God, Dave, are we calling Louise again? <laughs> Maybe. We might. Um, no. uh, well, we might call her, but what I can tell you is that we have a lot of video game stuff to talk about because this is the Spotlight Games podcast where each week we spotlight the latest and the greatest in the world of video games. You can get it by subscribing to our YouTube channel at Spotlight Games Pod or by searching for Spotlight Games in your favorite podcast app. And hey, you can be on the show. By tuning in as we record live at twitch.tv slash Spotlight Games Pod every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And if any of you fuckers live outside of America, we had the, the little daylight savings time happen recently. So my it's a different hour for you than than what you're what you're used to. But all you gotta do is follow us on Twitch so that you're notified when we go live so you can be part of the conversation. Cayman. Yes, sir. We, a lot to discuss this week in our little podcasting universe universe sure. corner of the world. We had finally last night, I was able to record with Jeremiah and his wife, Jalissa, episodes one and two of the final season of HBO's Succession. Did a little deep dive, a little different than the Last of Us uh show that we did, only because, you know, this isn't an adaptation. We're not comparing it to another thing. Mm -hmm. But still fun conversation, still talking about those dirty little Roy's and that just those problems that they have being rich little fuckers. Do you think uh, do you think that like life is imitating art or art is imitating life? Because today, Patrick, while yeah. we record, Donald Trump has been indicted. Sure. Do you think that there's a connection here? You know, because aren't like they're they're just like always on the verge of being arrested for shady shit and not the plot. Well, so, def so definitely in previous seasons, there was a big, uh, there was a cover up happening mm. and someone was going to have to take the fall light mm. spoilers. Uh, but it, it's still kind of the through line of the show 
as it's called succession, the through line is who is going to eventually take over the business. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there is a, you know, it's not too far off Mm -hmm. that Donald Trump was, uh, was arrested because the, the Roy family, they're basically in charge of this fictional universe is Fox news. So it's all connected. It's all connected. So it's all connected. But Cayman, we also have a mm. new episode of Safe Trash Cinema. Of the we Mind. do, Patrick. We do. This episode actually is brought to you by Patrick. Um, he was the one that picked the movie out, and that movie is 1992's hybrid of live action animation, and it's just 100 percent horniness, uh, which is uh, which is called yeah. a cool world or just cool world. And we have a lot of issues over the title cool world because it doesn't really work in terms of a title. That movie's fucking crazy, dude. Crazy. Um, Not sure what else to say. The movie is one of the weirdest things we've covered so far. And we've covered (laughs) some weird shit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Weird movie. Brad Pitt's in it. Gabriel Byrne. Kim Basinger's in it. It was directed by Ralph Bakshi from Fritz the Cat. Uh, very famous cartoonist. It's a weird fucking movie. Weird. It was just movie. Patrick and I also. So it was a weird episode just all around. And it was uh, great. I had yeah, a great I think time. I, yeah, I had a great time recording, a uh, great time editing it, a uh, great time releasing it. So if yeah. you haven't checked it out yet, go on over. Uh, it's currently live on all of your favorite streaming services. Mm. So you can go listen to the two of us talk about stuff. Stuff. I don't really Noids know and else. doodles. Noids um, and doodles and don't fuck cartoons and stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the one rule. Cayman, why don't we continue to talk about stuff mm. by talk about by talking about, excuse me, mm-hmm. what we've been playing. So, you know, last week you gave us a nice, deep mm-hmm. impression of Resident Evil 4 Remake. Since then, I have played yes. a lot of it. I've, I also finished Chia but I'm about seven and a half hours in a Resident Evil remake. And the short version is the game's fucking so good. Game is so fucking good. Patrick. It's so good. Now we're playing. So I'm playing on just standard difficulty. Yeah. And the game is tough. Yeah. Even on standard. Yeah. How are you feeling? So I'm playing it on hardcore mode. Yeah. So when, when you boot it up and you go to start playing it, I normally like if, if there are more than three options, if there's more than just easy normal and hard i like to do like whatever is second to the top so like if there's mm-hmm. like baby ass baby mode uh easy normal hard nightmare i like to do hard sure so this one they're only being three i was like uh, i don't know i think i'm gonna do standard but then it said for people who have played resident evil 4 i think i think it said like multiple times or something like that and mm-hmm. i was like you know what i'm gonna trust this the developers of this game as someone who has played that original several times, I'm going to go for it. And I thought I made a huge mistake about mm-hmm. an hour in. Um, sure. The the first interaction in the village with the chainsaw boy, difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, but And there have been a couple instances since then. So if you've played the game, I am now in the castle. Uh, the, not necessarily a spoiler, but that gives you an idea of how far in I am. There have been a few moments where I'm like, man, this is really tough. But honestly, I am having a lot of fun playing on hardcore mode. And I think it's because it's making me have to really think sometimes, like, how do I get through this? Not just yeah. not just like, how do I survive per se, but like, I need to be- to get creative or else I won't be able to get through this. And so that's been a fun challenge. Mm-hmm. And so far, none of the situations have been so dire that I'm like, all right, I'm going to have to start this game over because about an hour in the first time I started to maybe flirt with the idea of starting over, I realized you can't change the difficulty once you've started the game. Yeah. Not on so, hardcore at least. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, Oh man, this might be a huge mistake, but I think I feel like I've gotten through some of the toughest parts of the game by this point and i feel like if i've gotten through those then i can do anything in this game um but it's man it's so fun yeah uh here's the thing it's it's definitely interesting where you are now is where i started to get like my first hang-ups where i'm like okay this shit is getting more and more difficult yeah in terms of like number of enemies and that kind Mm -hmm. of thing 
Yeah. Yeah. And so it, where you are now, like everyone is now starting, their heads are all popping off. Yep. And they're all turning into these. And then they starting, there's a new one that you might not have seen yet. The, like the thicker. Yeah, okay. So pop. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I just certain, had the first interaction with the thick ones. There's a certain point in the game in which you are in an area in which there are just, it just feels like a never ending swarm. Yeah. And you got Ashley and O and they're just keep picking her up. And I was like, I like entered the encounter with like almost no ammo anyway. And like, God damn, I got to a certain point where I was just like, okay, I just need to take a step back. Reef. I mean, just like once I died a couple times, I was like, I, I just got to figure out like what to do next. Like, how do I get through this area? And I think this is what I love about the game is there are. Yeah. There are ways to be able to do things that are different than like what you would normally think. Cause like, and when I first approached this area, I was like, okay, just, I take the swarm and then I kill the one person I need to kill. That's, that's making my life hell. Yeah. Cause like, that's kind of how it is. Like so many people, I was like, I can't just get up there and I have to keep track of Ashley. And was it, like, the, was it the section where she is like on a different level than you turning things? No, 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 not the okay. water level. Well, this, uh, is is that the water level where she's like t like uh, there's like a, a walkway that she's trying to activate for you and there's like the multiple. water level that yeah. is that we call that the water level okay yeah that's the water level uh it's very designed very differently than the first one uh but that was another one where i was like i ended up making it through the like one run like one walkthrough uh and was able to get through without dying but i was like i literally walked out with like one handgun bullet and that was all i had yeah i was like jesus i just Christ. finished that before we recorded and i had a so much ammo and it's all gone yeah uh, when, when you said the water level i thought there's a, a point earlier in the game when you go into this like swamp area where like everything Ooh. like it's all covered in water i thought that's what you meant mm. by the water level. no so sorry, in continue. The, yeah so and I, the reason we all like address it as the water level is that was the water level in the first one we didn't have those like swampy you had the lake but you didn't couldn't explore the lake you were just there to kill the 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 big El Drago or whatever yeah, the fuck yeah, that yeah. big yeah. lake monster was. So like, this is the castle water level. This is, was like the most notoriously hated level in the game. They definitely reworked it. And yeah, you go in like fully stocked with ammo and then you walk out with nothing. Yeah. And then that kind of really sets up the rest of the castle is just constantly being in situations where you have like just enough ammo to survive. Yeah. And this one part, I was like, this is just got too much. And did always there's like RNG, right? When you like destroy crates or like crates or, or pots in the castle, yeah, there's a lot yep. of pots. And so, like, I'm in this level and like I died a few times and I'm like, this fucking sucks. I'm like trying to figure out, like, I don't have, I don't have like zero ammo. I have no shotgun shells. I have like one rifle bullet and I have like handgun ammo and SMG ammo. And that is all I have. Yeah. And I don't even have a lot of handgun. It was like 60 SMG bullets, which 60, 30 SMG, an entire clip will take one enemy down. Right. With an SMG. The thing fucking sucks. I don't even know why I use it anymore. Like I've got other guns. I could probably use it or better. Um, and so I kick the pot and the first thing that pops up is a fucking hand grenade. Mm. And I was like, oh boy, I know what I'm about to do. And sure enough, I changed up my tactic and was able to end up like, looping enemies around and like just taking them out one by one uh, yeah. it's really cool i do like the inclusion that flash grenades will just immediately kill any of the the yes. plagos head popper things yeah um i'm where i am right now and it is very different um they definitely have changed up the order of things but like i am now underground <laughs> okay okay um yeah which is not in the like the normal order of the way that this game works like i don't it's like if i remember correctly this is not something you do until after you kill like one of the big bosses you then go underground yeah um, i am now underground and i'm like well this is fucking weird so like yeah it is really cool they throw in so many curveballs in this game dude that are just like man that's my my biggest takeaway so far is so I mentioned a couple weeks ago on the podcast, I replayed Resident Evil 4 on my Switch within the last year and a half, maybe a year ago. Sure. So like I have a pretty decent memory of this game, but it's still like I still like have forgotten some things. I feel like I didn't recognize so much of the first half of this game. Yeah. In a good way. Like it. this really 
kind of in a way doesn't even feel like a remake. It really feels like a reimagining at times. Yeah. A friend of the show, uh, Mondo, who was on the show several, several, I mean, months ago at this point, tweeted out today something along the lines of, um, there was like just like one of these random Twitter accounts. It's like, what's your game of the year so far? And it showed Resident Evil 4, Hogwarts, Dead Space, and another game that doesn't matter for the sake of this conversation. Mm-hmm. And he, his whole point was, I hope that outlets don't necessarily give game of the year to remakes because it might set a precedent. Mm. And I responded. I was like, I agree with you on Dead Space, but I don't know that I agree with you yet on Resident Evil mm-hmm. 4 because of I'm about, you know, six and a half hours in and it it truly feels like a totally different game. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Like it, there's a lot to recognize here and there. Like all of the, the big giant beats are still the same, but like there are entire sections that I'm like, this didn't exist in the last game. There are entire like paths and ways that the story is unfolding is like totally different. Like it, where you kind of made this point uh, last week where Dead Space was like one to one. This is certainly not that. And that is so exciting to me. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, Terry in the chat, hearing y'all talk about RE4 remake is really making me want to check it out. But I just know I'll be too scared to continue. No, 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 no. It, no. I don't think you will. Play. No, I don't think yeah. you will. I there mm-hmm. are moments that are I got pretty jump scared uh, earlier today. Uh, there's a moment where you fall through a floor. That's all I'll say. And I about fell out of my chair. But that's like the only time I've been scared this whole game. Uh, yeah, I yeah, got I, go I think it. and I'm a little you got to remember, like I'm a little baby back bitch when it comes to horror games. Um, I don't I think I've only been like jumped once. And then there's only really been, I think, like one part of the game that I've experienced so far that I've genuinely been like, I don't like this. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's it's very quick. It's very short. And it's pretty easy to get in and out of. Um, Patrick, you haven't gotten there yet. You'll know yeah, exactly okay. what I'm talking about when you do. But like outside of that, though, I definitely think that they've about they have found like a really good balance on like making a horror game that you have like full autonomy in. And you really can like dictate how scared you want to be. Cause like if you like you probably might you you probably will have a worse experience if you are scared by these games if you play in hardcore mode. When you are not only are you scared by like there there's enemies everywhere and the spooky things, yeah, but you're also like terrified because you're like, I have such limited ammo and stuff. Like I would say if you play the game, like play it on assisted mode. I've, I've watched a streamer play assisted mode and it really is like a couple shots to the head enemies done. Yeah. You know, whereas like you can definitely tell there's a huge leap in difficulty from assisted into standard. Yeah. So like, I would say like in that obviously is going to lessen your fear factor. If you're not as scared going into an encounter because you're like, Holy shit, I have no ammo. I have to get tricky and I've got all the, you know, in that like ratchets up the, your anxiety, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so like, I definitely, so I do like that, that you really can, like, you can, you can fuck around with it to get the, the intensity level that you want. Uh, I'm, I think I'm most excited about, because once you beat the game, it doesn't matter. I think you have to beat it on standard or hardcore. You unlock professional mode and professional mode has all sorts of like weird shit involved with it. But like, I'm actually kind of excited. Like I might skip hardcore and just go straight into professional. Yeah. Um, because there is like some bonuses that you can get in professional mode that like you don't have anywhere else where you start with like different guns that are already like partially upgraded. Oh, cool. So it is like a little bit of a different experience and like, I kind of want, but I also am like, I am kind of wanting to do a new game plus run on assisted mode and just fucking speed run the shit out of it. Yeah. And like, actually, cause that was like my favorite thing back in the day was like going into new game plus and then like, how quickly can I beat this game? Yeah, uh, but man, dude, I, and this is one of the first games I think I've played in a long time that I've legitimately been like, I'm ready to be done with this game so I can play it again. Yeah, for and sure. I'm like, like, and I also like feel like I'm taking time playing through this one where it's like I feel like Dead Space at a certain point Dead Space, as much as I enjoyed playing that game, like, I don't know. There's like a certain point where I was like, yeah, this is very much Dead Space. And this is exactly what I remember from Dead Space. And I got what I needed. Yeah, we're like this game. I'm like, I am so ready to play this again a completely different way. Yeah, and I, I at the time, like, I still, I still really, really loved the Dead Space remake. Oh and, yeah, but at, at the time, not having played this, I'm, I'm so glad that 
Dead Space came out first. Because if I've played if I'd played this and then did Dead Space, I would have been really disappointed with Dead Space, seeing what Resident yeah. Evil 4 has done with it. Um because it makes me like I've also toyed with the idea of doing a new game plus run on Dead Space. I had started one like right after I finished it, but I only played it for like an hour. I don't think I'm gonna go back to do that now. Yeah, because no, I I, I will on Resident Evil 4 though, for sure. And I do think um, it's it's important too to point out that like I do think it was great that Callisto Protocol came out right before Dead Space, so we set the bar low. Yes, and we went into a, a really good game, which is the Dead Space remake, and that set the bar high. And yeah. then then I think it's important that we do set the bar high sometimes, because then when you get a game like this, like you really can appreciate like the level that this game is on compared to, um to other games like it, yeah, it sure. really is like very different yeah i agree uh last thing on resident before uh, terry in the chat uh he says i'll for sure try the demo at least be careful because the demo has no difficulty settings and can be a little on the difficult side and that's like one of the most famously high stress situations in the game granted it is like one of the first situations in the game and it but- is i think so far for me i would say it is top three probably most most difficult areas of the game easily yeah yeah Yeah. um but not to say that that's not fun but that if you were were to like maybe go in on on assisted mode like cayman was saying the demo might potentially scare you off um Mm -hmm. no pun intended but yeah i'm i'm really excited to keep playing this game and we have a bit of a stacked like second half of april so i kind of want to like get through this soon so i have time to get that before burning shores and then before even more so uh, just Star Wars Jedi Survivor. But we're going to wait and see what happens. Something that we're going to have to wait a long time for, maybe forever for, Cayman, is the return of E3 because E3 is dead. Is dead. Uh, I'm pulling from Rebecca Valentine at IG, and this news broke. It's funny, at the end of last episode, we were like, next week we're going to talk about this because we feel like E3 might be dead. And then like 24 hours later, it, it, it was a solid call on your part. Yeah. Um, almost a year after announcing its return, the Entertainment and Software Association announced today mm-hmm. to its members that this year's Electronic Entertainment Expo, widely known as E3, has been canceled. IGN can confirm. Two sources have confirmed to IGN that the organization announced the cancellation via an email sent out to its members today. The email said that while E3, quote, remains a beloved event and brand, end quote, that the, 20, uh, that the 2023 version, quote, simply did not garner the sustained interest and necess- uh, excuse me, the sustained interest necessary to execute it in a way that would showcase the size, strength, and impact of our industry, end quote. The ESA concludes the email by reiterating its commitment to advocacy work. It does not mention undertaking the show again in future years. And then following that report, the ESA did issue another public statement from Kyle Marsden Kish, global VP of gaming from Repop that said this was a difficult decision because of all the effort we and our partners put toward making this event happen, but we had to do what's right for the industry and what's right for E3. We appreciate and understand that interested companies wouldn't have playable demos ready and that resourcing challenges made being at E3 this summer an obstacle that they couldn't overcome. For those who did commit to E3 2023, we're sorry we can't put the showcase on that you deserve and that you've come to expect from Read Pop's events experiences. The press release adds that Read Pop and the ESA will continue to work together on, quote, future E3 events. So they did later say there will be future E3 events, mm-hmm. but they didn't say there will be a future E3, just future E3 events, so like a little muddy. But to continue with Rebecca's report, the event was supposed to be held June 13th through the 16th at the LA Convention Center and would have been the first in-person E3 since 2019. The event was canceled, obviously, in 2020 due to the pandemic. And while a digital version was held in 2021, the event was canceled in 2022 again in an effort to focus on revitalizing the showcase that would set a new standard for hybrid industry events e3's return for this year was announced just uh, last june alongside the confirmation that e3 2022 had been canceled uh the news comes as multiple big names in the industry from xbox nintendo playstation and most recently ubisoft announcing that they would not be attending e3 in any capacity with most opting to host its own digital showcases so came in before i jump into some questions i have for you Mm -hmm. i think it's important to to give some clarity, give some context to our audience in case they're not super familiar with E3. A lot of folks 
in the industry and like enthusiast folks like me and Cayman would always kind of think of E3 as like the Super Bowl of video games. Yeah. It was like half a week, usually like a Wednesday to a Sunday of the first half of the week would be showcases from PlayStation, Nintendo, uh, Xbox. And then, you know, as the years went on, we'd get them from Ubisoft, uh, Bethesda, uh, Square, like all of the major publishing houses in the gaming industry would come together and each of them for like 30 minutes to an hour, just be like, hey, these are all the games we're working on that we want to share. This is when some of them are coming out. And it was essentially just like the most hype week ever. We get, we would learn about all of the things that are coming up. There would always be this like dry spell leading into the summer because everyone was waiting to announce their stuff at E3. So it was just like such a fucking awesome thing. But like over the last, what would you say, like decade, it just like slowly kind of started. Yeah. And the pandemic definitely. And then the pandemic was like the death blow. Yeah, it, it was the nail in the coffin. But do you think that this is the end of E3? Like, do you think that this, it will ever come back? Or do you think like Summer Game Fest by Jeff Keighley is like the new evolution of what E3 will be? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I don't think that this will be the end of E3. It is the end of E3 as we know it. Yeah. Um, I could see us getting a more digital version of that where they attempt to do it. But like it... I think the big thing is, is, is you got to think about like the financials involved in something like that. Like just going to a trade show alone, like how much money goes into just doing just like a standard trade show. It's thousands and thousands of dollars for just a, a small company to attend just a standard trade show. And when we talk about E3, we're not talking about like your fucking, you know, RV and camper trade show in, in Macon, Georgia. Like that's not what yeah. like this is literally like. They're spending these companies are spending easily hundreds of thousands of dollars, yeah, to be there. Sometimes, I mean, maybe like a million plus, yeah. And so, financially, especially after the pandemic hit, it doesn't really make sense anymore. We've moved to much more of a digital space that, like, there's really not a need to have something like this where you just have one big event every year and that's when you drop shit, especially, you know, I think Jeff Keeley kind of started to poke holes in the formula of e3 by introducing the game awards and summer game fest where he was like yes like we can still hold this in person but like this is much more valuable for as like a value proposition to these companies yeah so i i, I wouldn't be shocked to see if like they do try to pull something off but it's more it's more small scale all digital and then you have like indie publishers showing up and that's really it uh, I don't think we'll ever see an E3 that that pulls in the likes of Microsoft or Sony or even Nintendo. I mean, sure. especially now that they're doing like Microsoft is doing their showcases or what, what do they call them? Their Microsoft Developer underscore direct fucking stupid name. Yeah. Um, you know, Sony has their state of plays. Nintendo has their directs. Um, a lot of companies just hold their own shit, too. So, like, I don't I don't think we'll see that, but I do think it's important, like the legacy, though, Patrick, of, of E3, one of the biggest moments that a lot of people reflect on when talking about E3 is the what they call is the moment was the console killer moment. Oh, man. And that was when well, there's multiple of those, but it was the first one that ever happened with Sony it happened back in 1995 when they introduced the uh, the Sony PlayStation and. This was like on the heels. You had like Sega was like pushing their shit. Nintendo was kind of like the hot stuff. And Sega was kind of like trailing them. And then Sony comes out and is like, we have a disc based console. Yeah. They can store so much more. And look at this graphical fidelity. Also, this is the price point. And it was like just an absolute shell shock moment that like just completely disrupted the way that video game consoles work. Yeah. And like that is what E3 was for years. Um, you know, Patrick, one of my personal favorite moments was actually when G4 was still a thing. Yeah. Um, back, I want to say it was, I mean, shit, we just watch G4 all the time, explain all that. But G4 would always do during the week of E3, they would do from like when the doors open for the public or for journalists until doors closed. Um, they would be holding all day events, press conferences. It's so fucking cool. All, and I would just sit there for hours in front of the TV, just watching all of these incredible new games being released. And it's just, you know, and so like we grew up on this. Like the, E3 was incredibly important. 
And, you know, I guess the thing is, is nothing gold lasts. Yeah. It just, yeah, that, the other thing that I kind of didn't mention when I was kind of providing that context was, so the first half of it would be all of those showcases. And then the second half would be open for like for journalists and people that were invited to do demos and things like that. And then there would be like the G4 TVs that were just showing us footage of all these new games and interviewing developers. And yeah, I remember like summer when we were still in school, that week was magic. It was just so exciting to just sit on the couch all day and just watch a, like learn about the new Zeldas and the new Marios and, and these new games, like especially like as the tech started getting bigger and better, like seeing like, Oh my God, this is what video games are now. But you, you brought up a good point, a good, nice little segue into some of our favorite E3 moments uh, from years past. I, I send this out to our audience as well to get a few and, you know, anyone in the chat, feel free to drop any of your uh, highlights for E3. Um, but one that came in, uh, First one I want to address, mm-hmm. friend of the show, Elliot Folds, says, came in owing Patrick $10, and then he provides the the timestamp, Spotlight Games E3, October 2021. It's, it made me laugh because this wasn't actually an E3 moment. This was just a Nintendo Direct. But I did at least want to bring up that time that came and owed me $10. Yeah. I don't even really remember what it was about. I think it was about Smash Brothers. Probably. I think. Uh, right. But But even though that wasn't technically E3, Nintendo directs were born directly out of E3 because they were the first major publisher to like officially pull out of E3 like long term. And they were like, we're going to do these directs now. And then they started doing directs more than just in June. And so it directs really in a way are like the evolution of E3 from Nintendo because they were like, we would rather do these things every like three to four months instead of save everything for June. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, that, but that was, I just, you know, that was episode three. I went all the way back to figure out that was episode three. Kate. It was probably, then it was probably me being wrong about probably Nintendo Direct. Uh, but so you just shared one of yours. I want to share one of mine, Cayman. Sure. The year is 2015. Okay. There are a few from, I mean, 2015 was a great year for E3, but specifically, the Bethesda showcase in 2015. Oh my god, yeah, that was an amazing, probably maybe, one of the greatest showcases of all time. Maybe one of the great, like top two or three showcases of all time. Like just in terms of just like the quick highlights, that was when for, do you even remember when the previous Doom was? It had to have been at least a decade since we had seen It was Doom, Doom 3, yeah. It yeah. was the early 2000s. So they showed off the Doom reboot, which, you know, Doom isn't a franchise that I particularly care about, but... It was just, it was hype as fuck to see a new Doom and it be like such a huge um, upgrade from what we would have seen last Doom in Doom Three. But that's we also got Dishonored Two, which is, was really highly anticipated. But then even bigger, they like set the standard at the time, showing off Fallout Four and saying, mm. and it's out in like three months. Oh because yeah. Because for for so long, the the thing was like another one that. Uh, I'll talk about at some point, same thing, uh, PlayStation's showcase in 2015. That's when we got uh, The Last Guardian finally. And that's when we got mm. uh, Final Fantasy VII. And it's like these things that we wouldn't see for several years that Bethesda, meanwhile, was like, hey, here's this massive game that everyone has been wanting for a really long time, a decade at this point almost. And it's out in like three months. And it, I just remember it just being such a like – that this is how you do a video game showcase was the Bethesda yeah. 2015. That's one of those ones where like every now and then I just like go and watch like a, a cut of the Bethesda 2015 showcase because it's just so fun to watch. You know, it's, it's, I, I like that you mentioned that. Cause the thing is, is like E3 wasn't just like the special moments weren't just game reveals. A lot of it too was like just little moments that took place. And personally for me, one of my favorite moments um, was actually during I think it was either the nintendo direct or was the ubisoft direct or ubisoft presentation in mm-hmm. uh, 2017 i think it was the ubisoft presentation because they had like this big reveal at this one point where shigeru miyamoto walks yeah. out the creator of mario so he walks out on stage and everyone's like what the fuck is miyamoto doing at an ubisoft presentation this is not yeah. right and then he announces mario plus rabbits so here's the thing though 
the special moment wasn't announcing the game. It's what happened during the announcement in which he thinks the lead developer on Mario plus rabbits dude fucking breaks out in tears, right? Yeah. Stands up. He bows to Miyamoto. Miyamoto says basically something along the lines of like, he's like, I asked them specifically to just make a Mario game that no one's ever seen before. And they not only delivered it, but they crushed any expectations I have. Could you imagine being the developer in that moment, right? Who's like, no, like this is like, he is like, Miyamoto is a god in the industry. And then having essentially so many different people's like legends uh, and hero come up on stage, not only address you, but be like, you did so fucking well. Just an amazing thing. It was just one of those moments where I think like, You know, we look a lot of times because of just what we do. We look at a lot of these games and we look at developers and we talk about this stuff and we shit talk and we praise and we do X, Y, Z. But like there are humans who work on these things that are like impacted in ways that we don't even notice. And I think that was one of the most like humanistic elements that I think we don't really get anymore when we through the digital presentations. Right. Like you don't have those real life moments that like happen in real time where you get to see something like that. All of this shit's been cut and edited and pieced together, and it's all very much manufactured. But like that moment in particular was not like that was one of those like spur of the moment things that just occurred and was just really fucking special. Yeah, I think like that's just that's it. That's Ethan. Those are the most like there are a lot of what I have on my list is like tied to specific game reveals, but that's a really good one. And I don't remember the year, but like the the first year that uh, that we met Reggie for yeah. nintendo yeah back it, in it was like four four maybe yeah. I, I think because you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier back in the early aughts e3 was so business focused they would show fucking powerpoints and like uh what their earning potential is like it was very much like a mix of an investor call with the occasional trailer and that one uh i forget his exact quote is like i'm reggie uh, I'm I, I'm here to kick ass, take names, and make video games, or something like that. And and that was also the year we got uh, our first look at Legend of Zelda: Twilight Princess. Mm-hmm. And uh, th- it's just like th- that. Like I think we also got the DS that year. Yeah. Um, and it's just like those moments of like, there's the really exciting like reveals of video games, but those like Reggie who would go on to become a fucking legend. This is the first time we ever saw Reggie on an E3 mm-hmm. stage, like that kind of shit. And then there's also like the huge bomb moments too. Whether, I mean, Nintendo has had a ton of them with like Wii music. One of the most famous ones with PlayStation is the wonder book. Oh uh, dude. The, when PlayStation announced that the PlayStation three was costing $600 and you yeah. can hear a pin drop from people just being like, you're kidding. Yeah. That that Which almost, almost I killed mean, the PlayStation 3. Well, you, I mean, if you look at the bombs, like there's been some really funny ones, but then there's been some just devastating ones. They really set the tone for like an entire generation. I think one of the biggest ones in that regard was when Microsoft announced the Xbox One. Yeah. And when then they announced the console, when they announced it, it was much more expensive. Uh, they announced that it was like, there's going to be no more used games. You can't yeah. play used games on the console. Always and then online. they were like, always online and then i think the bigger one was like oh and we're gonna spend all of this time instead of talking about all these great games we're gonna spend all this time t- telling you how the microsoft connect yeah. is the next thing that will revolutionize that thing sucked but people walked out of that being like because they just came off the heels of essentially dominating for years mm-hmm. in the industry the the 360 was such a big deal and then sony had the fucking hack that took place that like shut down all of their online servers for yep. months and everyone was like we are like sony is on the like the there is sony's about to stop making fucking consoles yeah they this were in is trouble. going yeah like this is going to be a nintendo and microsoft industry get used to it and so sony starts to get their footing again towards the end of the playstation 3's lifespan you know they're dropping some big hits we got uncharted yeah. we've got you know we got some big games that are coming through and then they drop and they announce the PlayStation 4, and then they have one of the biggest, and this was the second time Sony's had the console killer moment where it like set the stage. Microsoft has just fucked up their entire presentation. Shit the bed in a way I had never seen before. And then we have we have the moment in which they come out and said, this is how you can play games on PlayStation. 
if you want to play used games, you can play used games. This is not always online. And if you want to share a game with your friend and then it cuts over and I forgot who it was. It was, uh, it was Ryan, uh, Shuhei and Shuhei uh, Adam Boyce. Boyce. Yeah, Adam Boyce. And he's like, they just hand the game to each other in the back. And they're like, and that's how you can share games with friends. And Iconic. it was like, yeah, honestly, one of the biggest moments in gaming was like that. And it is still like that meme still lives on. Yeah. And like it was definitely like in a way you had to be there moment. But like I will never forget watching that press conference in my living room after watching because that was when I like I was in college. Mm. This was 2013. And I was like really starting to get into gaming like in a bigger way. Like I yeah. got the PlayStation 3. I started listening to Podcast Beyond, which, you know, to go way back to the, our first episode, that's like what really kind of got me into gaming in, in like a much kind of deeper way. And um, so I was watching like all the press conferences and we were texting each other about all these things. And that press conference was you could tell that they because Xbox went first. I, I can't remember if it was the same day. If it wasn't the same day, it was the day before Xbox was. You could tell that PlayStation tweaked some things, reworked some of their timing of things to just use it as a fucking hit piece on Xbox. Oh, yeah. And it was incredible to watch. And you could see, too, just like the confidence when they walk on stage and they're like doing it. Like they know they're like, we have a revolver that's fully loaded and we're about to land a precise headshot yeah. with each single bullet. Yeah. And like they first, knew. The first thing I think they did, or and actually, no, I think it was at the end when they announced the price and it was either 50 or a hundred dollars cheaper than the Xbox. It was a hundred. Yeah. And people lost their fucking, I, yeah, I think yeah. Xbox one was 499 and PS4 was 399. Mm -hmm. And it was, I was like, how do I immediately use what's left of my student loans to pre-order this PS4? Because I I am so hyped right now watching Jack Trenton just tear apart Phil Matrick because also um, or Don Matrick because also like you had mentioned that the uh, six hundred dollars for the PS3 it was like a repeat of history where Sony dominates PS2. And they think like, oh, we're so hot shit that we can charge $600 for a console. And they famously in that press conference said that people would get a second job to get a PlayStation 3 because that's how good it was going to be. Mm. And then Xbox turns around and does the exact same shit with Xbox One thinking that they know what's best because they just dominated a console cycle. And it took them the entire generation to catch back up. It, and, honestly, I think if they didn't drop Game Pass... I don't yeah. think that we would even this conversation would even be happening, but you can still you can even look back at that moment, like that moment in time when they did that, like that was the turning moment for Microsoft to be like, oh, fuck. Yeah. So what do they do? They immediately go out there. They buy out fucking Bethesda mm -hmm. and they're like, we have to get shit like we have to get people to play our consoles because like we've put all of our eggs in the shitty basket yeah and it is falling apart and now we kind of see like sony's on the back foot now you A know they're bit, going yeah. yeah i mean they're going up you've got the the microsoft or the you've got the activision acquisition that could potentially happen to, maybe not who knows yeah um but like sony's kind of in a place now where it's like the ground is much much more even and it really is because of game pass yeah and so like you know, it's but that's kind of I think it's weird. It's always weird, right? When we see this, like you know, whether it was the, the Sony's PlayStation One being like this is going to be the death blow to consoles. Mm -hmm. You always just have Nintendo that's just like hanging out in the background, just being like, it doesn't fucking matter what we do, we're Nintendo. Yes, and you've got like these two titans of industry just constantly every console generation just you know throwing blows trying to fuck each other over <laughs> yeah and taking advantage of what they can and you got nintendo that's just like fuck you yeah we're fine uh to bring in another one uh, another friend for the, of the show nick from the audience he said uh in terms of a favorite e3 memory always the reveals loved the god of war 2018 reveal in 2016 the orchestra and the reaction with kratos came out the 2016 show was insane in mm -hmm. that one we got god of war we got the uh first reveal of spider-man ps4 we got days gone we got detroit become human we got the year prior they had revealed horizon zero dawn but the 2016 we got like a deep dive into horizon zero dawn we and then there were like a bunch of other shit we got uh gravity rush 2 which you know wouldn't 
go on to do a whole bunch, but we got a lot of VS, uh, PSVR in 2016. Like 2016 was another one of those like banner years mm-hmm. for, for PlayStation. Um, but yeah, I remember the 2016 reveal of God of War was the first time I cared about God of War because that demo and that reveal was so actually i think it was just a cinematic trailer was so fucking awesome yeah i was like oh wow this is not the god of war that i know that i was never interested in this is something new and uh you have my attention sony and here we are two games later and it's those two games are like in my top you know, ten games of all time so we always talk about like the we, we we've mentioned the like doubt da- like downfalls that have taken place we never really talk about like the the bounce back like i guess the sony's doing what they did was kind of a little bit of a bounce back but what sony needed in the moment coming off the heels of the psn hack and all that shit this 360 is essentially running rampart through the industry right like yeah it is the top selling console it is ridiculous like what they're doing so what does Sony do though? They have one announcement that almost changes everything for the way the PS3's trajectory is going. And that happened in E3 of 2010. Patrick, I don't know if you remember this. Gabe Newell. Oh yeah, yeah. The head of Valve, right? Walks out on stage during Sony's press conference and announces Portal 2 is coming to console exclusive for the PlayStation 3. Yeah, that reveal when that happened, when he walks on stage, it was one of the most insane reactions in an, from an audience like ever. Yeah, like one of just the coolest things in the world for Gabe Newell, the fucking Gabe, who's another like the the Miyamoto of fucking PC games. Yeah, walks out and announces Portal Two, console exclusive PlayStation Three, and Portal Two is is a masterpiece. It is one of the greatest games ever made. Yeah, top 10, for sure. Yeah. And so, like, that moment was, man, that moment was amazing, dude. Yeah, that's one of those ones where, like, you kind of never would have expected that to happen. Because in during the 360 PS3 generation, the orange box was on the 360 exclusively mm-hmm. uh, with Portal 1, Half-Life uh, 2, and Episode 1 and 2, and Team Fortress. And so it was like, if it's going to come anywhere, it's going to come to Xbox. For, yeah, for him to be on the PlayStation stage, is like, oh, wow. They must have given them so much money oh, yeah. for this. Uh, also, something else about E3 is that like w- games being revealed that you just are totally out of left field. Like, Do you remember when the Order 1886 was first announced? Oh, dude, yeah. You know what and I got to say? That game is not as bad as people say it is. It's not as bad as people say it is, but that's one of those things where I remember so vividly seeing that trailer and being like, this is going to be the biggest game ever made. Like, This is going to change everything. And then it kind of ended up just being a wet fart of a uh, of a release, well, I mean, mostly like, because of the critical uh, it was like, I kind think of backlash on it. 2000 and... Four maybe when they announced Killzone Two, they showed the trailer yeah. and, they, and everyone was like, "Oh my god, this is a video game!" And then people yeah. started to go back and like started siphoning through the footage and was like, "There's no gameplay here." Yeah, and like we had like one of those big shell shock moments where it was like, "They're they're lying to us." Yeah. Like we have these moments and like I don't think necessarily like with this moving to like a digital landscape especially now, like with the way the world works, like I don't, I don't really know. Like kind of the magic has been, I mean, don't get wrong. We still get big moments and big like reveals. Like we had when we forgot what, what it was. I think it was the game awards or something. We got the big reveal of uh killer clowns from outer space. was the yeah. game, which yeah. I know is so stupid and like nothing that like, honestly, I don't think there's too many people out there that they care a ton about this game coming out, but like the excitement of like, Holy, like no one saw that coming. And it hits harder for me. Sure. But like, you know, when and we kind of knew we were gonna get a Hades 2, but like during Game Awards, getting the Hades 2 trailer. Yeah. Be like, holy shit. And so there's like moments of like we still kind of have it, but definitely not like we used to. Now, and because also there was there's just like the spectacle. Like you go to 2018 and that was the last like big blowout for PlayStation yeah. in a in a live format where they had like different sets for each of their games where yeah. with the, the last of us two, they had yeah. like the lights so cool. and, and like the, like it was like you were in the tent if you not don't want to necessarily spoil anything, but, and then there was like a whole uh, ghost of Tsushima set. There was a whole uh, death stranding set. Like that's to go back to your, your, one of your first points about like the, just the amount of money that they spent on that 
to like you can't necessarily quantify the, a return, but you can when it's just digital because all it is is putting together video assets yeah. and you're spending a fraction of what they used to be spending. And it's like, it's a trade-off. Like we, we don't necessarily get as hype of the moments anymore, but it's probably better for the industry because that less money spent probably means more people get to keep their jobs and less layoffs and all that kind of shit. Came in there. There is some, some potential, um, some potential good news today mm. though. There there, two, okay. two little pieces, two little pieces. So even though capital E three is dead, there are some rumors that PlayStation might be doing a showcase right before Summer Game Fest. This is pulling from Andy Robinson at VGC. Sony Interactive Entertainment will reportedly hold a PlayStation showcase ahead of this summer's planned video game events. That's according to Giant Bomb journalist Jeffy Grub Grub, who has recently Grub reported Grub. on planned summer events ahead of their announcement in the past. According to Grub, a PlayStation showcase will be held sometime before the Summer Game Fest event on June 8th. The days of play hosted by Summer Game Fest on the 9th and 10th, and then the Xbox and Bethesda showcase on the 11th, and the Ubisoft Forward on the 12th. So, some so I would assume sometime between the first and the seventh is when this supposed PlayStation event will happen. And that's kind of the other interesting thing here is that even though the actual show of E3 is dead, the industry still uses the summer as a jumping off point for a lot of their announcements, and we see that in a way that and and especially if if uh, PlayStation is going to be doing their own showcase and there's a little Nintendo news we're going to talk about in a minute too. Um, but came in one, mm -hmm. do you think, what do you think the odds are that Jeff is right? And two, what do, would you expect to see at a PlayStation showcase this summer? Odds 99.9% .9 Jeff is right. Yeah, I think so um, it lines up. And if I'm Sony, I, I mean, I don't, it's a, that's such a tough one to do, right? On like when do you want to drop it? Do you drop it right before everything else drops? Try to get ahead of the curb, set the bar wherever you want to set it, or do you try to come in after and then hope that maybe no one else really had like a big bang and then you can come in and sweep behind? Yeah. So like trying to figure out like where to place it has to be like one of the most miserable things in the world to do. Um, in terms of what we'll see. I think that's another big thing too, is like Sony's going to have to drop some big news. Like yeah. Sony has to, they don't have an option this year with the fact that the Activision deal should be wrapping up. Yeah. Right around this time. Like they need to come out with something. So do you, do you do a situation where you come out and you say absolutely nothing at all? And like, you're just like, Hey, here's some, just some stuff coming out. And you just maybe you drop a couple hints at some things. You might show one big game and then you just kind of hope that like, you know, you kind of ex like you ex either you accept your faith that like this is going to suck because there's a potential reality in which like you've burned enough bridges, which I think is more important to point out the fact that like some of the last big news that's dropped from the acquisition is that Microsoft essentially has gotten a court to order sony to either nut up or shut up yeah uh in regards to apparently microsoft has requested that sony drop the next five years of all of their games need to be released to the court yeah and all of it will be made public and, and when you think about it like that right like this is not the movie industry where marvel or disney comes out and is like here's the next 15 years of avengers in 2067 movie. you're gonna yeah. get the avengers versus joe biden yeah <laughs> so like you know like this is not how this works the gaming industry revolves around secrecy yeah like they are so much you have to keep all of your assets closed off and try to keep it as secret as possible so either Sony shows off their hand for the next five years and shows off like, these are all the games we have, or they essentially back off and let Microsoft buy out the largest publishing house in video games right now. Sure. So if you're Sony and if you're going to nut up, this is when you come out and you drop every single game. That'd be that pretty you cool. have for the next five years. You go ahead and get ahead of it. And they're just like, you know what? fuck you and you you set yours or you just back off and are like we have to just rely on hope a thought and a prayer that'd be a pretty cool like 
industry shaking type thing where like if if they did a press conference that was like a mixture of what they normally do where they show us like kind of deep dives on the games that are coming soon like i would expect that we're going to see a lot about spider-man 2 yeah. in the summer i expect we're going to see death stranding 2 in the summer but what if they use the second half of it to like go the kevin feige route put on a big screen just like show a timeline and be like we're hoping that in 2027, we're going to get Resident Evil 9 and fucking God of War 3 again and fucking The Last of Us 4 and like all, all these things. I don't know. That'd be pretty, pretty wild. If that I mean, it's it would be tough trying to like posit everything else afterwards when you're like, you already know what we're doing for five years. I guess yeah. you could do that and you could go every single thing and be like, you know, it's coming, but here's an update and here's gameplay. Here's why you should be excited. Yeah. So I think them interesting. Going, yeah. So I think them going ahead like this, like if, if if I'm Sony right now with this looming acquisition, which could potentially end up with you losing Call of Duty, with you losing all of these huge titles, Overwatch, you know, Diablo, all of these big things you might never have access to again. Like you need to come out and just start shooting. That'd be a and, power fucking move. Yeah. And so like, I don't, I don't know unless Sony feels confident that the Activision deal is going to get squashed. And I don't think that they do right now. I think that you have to do that. And yeah, so I, if you're going to do it, now's the time to do it. Yeah. Terry says it'd be insane if Sony gave us everything, but I'd be so excited. I, I agree. Like I would actually, in a way, I just as an experiment for the next few years, I would love to just know everything in advance to see, okay, in 2024, when you have a showcase, and I already know what games you're that like you could show because I know of everything you're working on. Is there still that level of excitement? Is there still that draw to see, okay, well, what do these games actually look like? I know what they are, but I've not seen them. Yeah. I think there would still be just as much excitement. It may be like a tiny bit less, but not enough that it's not potentially worth trying yeah yeah you've compelled me on this cayman I'm if compelled. it happens man it'd be crazy as fuck yeah um something else that might happen this summer Mimoto is teasing mario new news in a future direct i'm pulling again from chris or from vgc but this time from chris scullion Shigeru Miyamoto has suggested that the next Mario game may be revealed in an upcoming Nintendo Direct. In an interview with Variety, Miyamoto was asked when the next Mario game would be released, given that Nintendo has just launched Super Nintendo World in Hollywood and the Super, uh, Super Mario Bros. movie comes out as of recording tomorrow. Uh, is it tomorrow? This is later this week. Is on. I have no fucking clue. Um, Miyamoto laughed and said, according to the video subtitles, quote, well, all I can say is please stay tuned for future Nintendo Directs, end quote. What Miyamoto actually said was a little more detailed than this, but gives the same general message. Quote, I can't say anything in advance, but we have Nintendo Directs every two or three months, so please look forward to those, he said. The last entry in uh, Mario was Super Mario Odyssey, which was released in uh, October 2017 on Switch. And like, sure, you read that quote and it could just be like, at some point they're going to release a Mario. So just keep watching our directs and there's going to be one sometime. But like, as we've both discussed, it's got to be happening soon. And if, I, I don't know, I feel like if Miyamoto, if there wasn't something on the horizon, he would have just completely dodged the question. But what do you think? Do you think we might get Mario at this next Nintendo Direct, which would probably likely be end of May, beginning of June? Yeah, if it's end of May, beginning of June, then yes, we like I genuinely feel in my bones we're getting a Mario game. And I wouldn't be shocked if the Mario game is not lined up for an October or November launch. Yeah. And I still believe a Switch 2 could be coming or a Switch Pro um, something, yeah. not like an OLED, like we're getting like an actual a real internal hardware upgrade to the switch. Yeah. Like they don't have an, I mean, we talked, I think it was last week. We talked about the fact that like, they don't have an option. They have to like, they have to do it. Yeah. And so this kind of lines up, man. It's a little bit off kilter considering. I think we had breath of the wild, which was like, I think it came after, uh, super Mario odyssey dropped. Um, or maybe it came before. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, they launched together, didn't they? Uh, it was close. It was very close. Let's see. Uh, Breath of the Wild release. Because the, uh, Breath of the Wild launched with it, 
on the Switch. So, okay. So Breath of the Wild was March 2017 when the Switch launched. And then Odyssey came in the fall, October of 2017. Mm. So, I, I mean, I still believe that, like, we are going to get a We're going to get a big upgrade to the Switch, right? Yeah. And if you're going to launch a new console, you have to launch it with a title. Yeah. If you're if you're launching the Switch 2, like you need to launch it alongside either Zelda or Mario. Like there's not an option. You yeah. have to do that if you're Nintendo. Or Donkey Konga. I don't think that they're gonna Those launch. are your three options. I mean Donkey Kong, but I don't think Donkey Kong has like the same legs like Mario or Zelda has. Donkey Konga. Oh, Donkey Konga. Okay. Pitch Wasn't that the Bongo one? Pitch it to me. I don't know. I think Donkey Bong. <laughs> <laughs> what was the what was the game with the bongos? Donkey Donkey Kong. Uh, let's see, Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. I for some reason thought it was called go. Donkey Konga. That's yeah. a better title, honestly. It's a better title, honestly. It's a better if, title. If they fucking did the better title like I just did, that joke would have nailed. Yeah, bro. It would have fucking nailed. Unfortunately, I'm a fool. It's fine. I'm more often than you are a fool. <laughs> uh, historically speaking, yes. Uh, but no, no. Like, I literally think, like, if you're and if you're going to announce a console launch, because, like, and here's the thing. I think why it works, right, is they're launching in May. They're going to be launching, we get Breath of the Wild, too. Tears of the Kingdom. Tears. So you get that, and you get, like, a very special limited release. People are fine with that. It is Donkey Konga, 2003, GameCube. No, sh- oh, z- oh, okay. So you were yeah. all right. So eggs on my face now. Hey, that's okay. We're we're both covered in eggs right now. We are both covered in eggs. So I think yeah, like if you're gonna do it, what you do is you do your direct, and you talk all about Mario, right? Or you don't. You talk all about the Switch. That is what you talk about. Sure. Okay? You talk about the Switch, and then you go, and this is going to be launching. Alongside the Switch 2. Boom. Hard cut directly into Odyssey 2. Yeah, yeah. And you get that shit. Then what you do is in like August. In the lead up to the launch of the console. Then you do a full direct about the Mario game. I mean. I love it. And I, I so desperately want a new 3D Mario game. It's been too long. It's been yeah. too long. Game. It's simply been too long. It's also been six years. Sweet Bennett in the chat asks that was Egg. It was something. About it. it was something. What do you guys think? Let us know. Do you think we're going to get new Mario soon? What were your favorite E3 moments? What do you think we're going to see from PlayStation? There's a lot that you can let us know. DM us, Spotlight Games Pod on Instagram. Email us, mail at spotlightgames.net. But before we go, Cayman, there are a couple little things I do want to let our audience know in terms of new games that are either available or coming soon. Actually, these are all available. Nothing coming soon. Nintendo Online Expansion Pack on the 12th of this month. You're going to be able to jump into Pokemon Stadium. And I, uh, our, our friends, not personal, Mar- uh, Wario64 shared a link. I got the little Nintendo 64 controller for Switch finally. Did you? So Hell we're yeah, going to give that a shot with Pokemon Stadium whenever that comes. Nice. Also, Sifu Arenas is out now on PC and Xbox. Or no, sorry. PC, uh, Sifu Arenas is a new mode out across all Sifu titles, but it was also released mm. on PC and Xbox. So go pick up that game on PC and Xbox if you haven't yet. I I was uh, reading a little bit about Arenas. I didn't realize like how huge of a mode it is. They've essentially like been like, you know what? We know what people want with Sifu. And the arenas mode is like essentially what if you could do like the Mr. Smith fight from Matrix Reloaded in Sifu? What if you could do like, and it's just like a bunch of like their versions of super iconic fights from That's movies. That's fucking dope. Which is awesome. So I'm going to be playing that soon. Uh, I might talk about it next week if I can play it before next week. And then I was hoping to get to play it before today's show to talk about it, but I didn't. And that is the murder of Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, as an April Fool's joke, Sega released a visual novel a murder mystery about the death, or rather the murder of Sonic the Hedgehog uh, on PC. And uh, it's somewhat compatible on Steam Deck. So I'm going to try to uh, play through that uh, uh, and give some impressions next week because I just, I'm obsessed with the fact that it wasn't just an April Fool's joke, that it's actually a full game that was developed to go along with their April Fool's joke. And to that, I yeah. say, good job. 
And honestly, yeah. from what I've read, apparently people really liked it. Like it's yeah. actually pretty good. So yeah. you know what? Good on Sega. Good on the good team on Sega. behind Sonic. That's that's really funny. And we need more shit like that, man. We do. We really do. And yeah. and also good on you, our audience, if you're still listening to our show, because we've reached the end. We thank you for your listenership and your viewership. Came in. Where can these folks that are still just being so sweet to us find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the Dumpster Boy or uh, you can find Save Trash Cinema at Save Trash Cinema on all socials. Hell yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, you can follow Spotlight Games on Instagram at Spotlight Games Pod. Same handle on TikTok and YouTube and Twitch. If you do twitch.tv slash Spotlight Games Pod every Tuesday, 8 p.m. live as we are right now, as I say this on Twitch, just talking, just being, just being us, you know. But until next week. I bid you adieu. I love you. <laughs>